What we're going to cover tonight is two main topics. Number one being outside riding, making sure that we're good to go outside for your bike and yourself, and then the other side is making sure we're good to go indoors for riding. Because just because it's winter, we don't want to make sure our bikes get put away for six months. So the first thing we want to do is sort of check our bike before we leave. So the sort of key areas you want to check are your chain, make sure it's looped. So wet loop, it's thicker, so it stays on your chain longer, especially in the wetter sort of times that you ride. Um, doesn't get washed off, but it does attract more um, dirt and debris to the chain, so you, you will need to wipe the excess off when you apply it, unlike uh, summer loop, which is a lot thinner and coats the chain a lot better. Yeah, so something like this, Magic Shine, Mountaineering uh, 5000S, 5000 lumen light, good to put it on the handlebar here. I'll just turn it on for you quickly. Really bright, really good for, for night riding. Yeah, I mean the Magic Shine series is really good, we have some that go up to 8000 lumens, um, nice and bright, but recommend to get something that's definitely nowhere below a thousand for sure. Uh, make sure we're over that bracket because when you're hurtling at speed in the middle of a forest at night, yeah, you do want to see. Uh, there's nothing worse than going into a tree. Uh, trust me, it's, it's not very fun. Uh, so awesome thing about these is they have a separate battery pack, so it all sits on your frame, on your bike. Um, some of them you can mount to a helmet, but probably would recommend chucking it on your bike, it means it's out of the way. If you're moving at speed, because I mean with lights there's two main things, there's lights to be seen and lights to see. Uh, lights to be seen would be something like this guy or your day blazer 1100 something like that we turn it on nice and bright you can see lights up really good if you want to be seen so daytime running lights something like that just something like these Bontrago ones here nice and bright you're still gonna get seen um, but they don't provide they're not like a torch so it means that if you're riding a night time you're not necessarily going to see much, but you're going to be seen perfectly. Um, and then obviously the faster you're going, the more lumens, because it's just the way light works. Tires, what do you do for tires in winter? Do you change between summer and winter? Um, not myself personally. I ride a road bike and commuting, and um, I just ride the same tires. I lower the pressure a little bit during winter, um, and ride during the rain as, as it is. Some people do prefer to get a uh, more treated tire during winter, just especially if they're riding on a, a looser surface. Um, but the general rule is for tires, the harder the surface, the harder the pressure, and the softer the, the surface, obviously the softer the pressure. And that's kind of similar for mountain biking, I suppose, if you're more that kind of path, um, dropping the pressure a little bit. Obviously winter, more mud, more dirt, more sand, that all kind of get slushy and mucky. Um, so dropping that pressure a little bit can help anywhere between, personal preference again, 25 to 30 PSI, um, somewhere like Woodhill, Riverhead, etc. Um, and then making sure, you know, you look at this kind of tie here, big, nice, knobbly tread, uh, means you're gonna grip, especially in those corners, you're not just gonna wash out and slide out. Um, again, not very fun, um, but you can run the same tires all round. You can run same tires in summer, winter, spring, autumn, all the things, but it's just making sure tire pressure. Daniel can show you quickly how to measure your tire pressure. So we carry a couple of things. Carry a gauge, turn it on and you'll place it on the valve and it'll read your tire pressure. The other thing that is really good is to have at home would be a, a floor pump. Has a gauge on it as well. So you check your tires before you leave. You would set them to your desired pressure. For your mountain bikers, we're a little bit less fussy about getting muddy and dirty. Um, it's kind of expected that if you're going mountain biking in the winter, you're gonna come back covered in mud. Um, so you almost use the guards a little bit more for the life of your bike than for yourself. Like this type here, um, a lot of people will know them as marsh guards. Um, they sit on your fork here and they're really good. They keep all the muck and the mud out of inside here. It doesn't get up in your crowns and anything. Keeps a little bit of splashing out of your face. But they're super simple to install. They're held on by four cable ties. Put them here. You can also do them at the rear. Here, um, not as common to see, but a really good thing because it will stop a bit of kind of dirt, stone, sand again on your dropper or your shock. Um, but that's almost all you need for mountain. Um, commuting, a little bit different. Um, I would recommend getting like a full coverage set. The main mud guards we sell is a Topic brand. Um, really awesome brand, super simple to put on. Ones like this, front and rear. Uh, you can buy them in a set or you can buy them separately. You put them on within five minutes, it's, it's really easy. This one's just a quick release collar type system uh, here on the seat post. Adjustable points all around so you can adjust. 
Um, and something like this covers the full size of your wheel. They come in different wheel sizes, so this being a 29er, you get a 29er size mudguard, you're gonna stay nice and clean and dry. Same for the front, sits up in your fork here. Front and rear, they snap on or off. Again, takes two seconds to install. The other thing to, to really look at is brakes. Um, brake pads, make sure that your brake pads aren't becoming contaminated from all the grime on the road and that they're not too thin. You can see the clear difference between the two. The one on this side here, um, that's a used contaminated worn brake pad. You can see all the kind of black, all the oil, the grit, the dirt, comes off on your fingers pretty easily. Um, whereas this is a brand new one, nice and clean, nothing there. Um, and if you turn it on the side, you'll see the wear on them. Um, if you don't have good brakes in winter, uh, yeah, with, you know, going fast, commuting, going downhill, you are gonna wanna stop. Um, things are more slippery, harder takes, for the bike to grip. Definitely so. takes longer to stop in the wet as well when you don't have a proper brake pad. Yeah. Once they get down to a minimum wear, or if they become contaminated with some sort of contaminant like um, a washing solution, brake fluid, uh, dirt and mud, uh, if they're starting to squeal, make noise, definitely bring them in um, and we can have a look and see whether they can be saved. Sometimes we can take the top layer off and keep the, the brake pad and resurface it, but sometimes they just need to be changed. It's hard to put an exact time frame on it, something like that. It, um, it all depends how you're riding, where you're riding, what you've done. So, But if you ever have a question, bring the pad in, bring the bike into your local store, um, and any of the bike department guys will be able to help you with those kind of things. When you finish riding a bike, a good thing to do is to, if you've been riding through the muck and, and dirt, is to wash it. Um, muck Off is a great product. Simply spray it on, give it a little bit of a scrub, wash it off, and then just let the bike dry off naturally. It just helps to, to take the salt off the bike. Any salt or dirt or debris that you pick up will rust. Once you've washed the bike, definitely lube the chain. Um, maybe hang it to dry as well. Hang it in your garage, in, in a, up high in a less humid area. The bikes are fairly well covered with paint, um, anodizing. That helps to protect the finishes, chroming on the bolts. When washing as well, if you have a pressure washer or a water blaster, uh, yes, yes. Uh, don't, don't use it on your bike. Um, yep. If you're putting that amount of force on your bike, the little bits like bearings and your bottom bracket and your hubs and everything, and all the grease it. that's in there that needs to be there, um, you're going to push out and wash out and you're going to come in and see one of us and tell us that your bike's creaking. Yep. The other things you kind of want to look out for is charge your lights back up. Yes, definitely. Uh, nothing worse than going out at 6 o'clock the next morning and your lights are dead. Uh, <laughs> Wouldn't recommend it. Um, other thing is if you use anything from your toolkit while you're out riding, say a puncture kit, a spare tube, if yep. you've had that, that bad luck, um, make sure you replace it as soon as you can. Um, you don't want to find yourself in the case of needing to puncture up um, another puncture and then you don't have anything. Um, so those kind of things are very key to do. Yeah, cool. So we've got a few things here. I mean, first thing important is a jacket. Um, there's a few different types of jackets. This here is like a mountain style jacket, so super lightweight, um, really packable, folds down nice and small. Um, and they're really good. This is a Fox Defend one. Um, nice and breathable, nice and breathable back on it, so you don't get hot and sweaty. Um, that is part of wearing a jacket, unfortunately, is your heat does build up a little bit more. Um, but as mountain bikers, we all know style is important. Black's in season. This is what I would go for. Um, going to keep light rain off you in heavy rain. You're going to get wet, but that's part of the fun. But light rain, windbreaker type of thing. This is really cool. For the commuters, um, high vis. High vis all the way. That's kind of what we're about is safety. Um, unfortunately, we all know what, you know, car drivers can be like while commuting. Uh, we're lucky that cycleways are becoming better, but the more you can stand out, the better. Um, this is the T7. Uh, Zenith, a really good jacket. You can see it's nice and bright. Um, it's also got back ventilation once again, covered so the water can't seep in. Um, pocket in the back so you can put some little goodies, put your cell phone. Um, and it's also got a long tail. You can see if we show the front, the the tail hangs down a lot more. Uh, that so your bum doesn't get wet, means it kind of covers around riding position obviously, your butt sticks out a little bit. Um, that covers you, keeps your butt nice and dry. Pair it up with a mud guard, no wet. Also pants. Um, these T7 pants, they're 10k, 10k uh, waterproof and breathable, so really good for riding in the rain, keep it nice and warm, and just once this tail goes over the top, it'll be pretty, pretty sussed. It is, it's a big personal preference thing, uh, me and Daniel, we, we both just wear shorts um, in the winter, it's, it's all what you're into. Um, Awkward getting, weather's uh, a, little, yeah. a little easier to ride in. We're a bit lucky up here, you can just wear a short, anything like this. 
Um, these are the T7 uh, mountain bike shorts. Fit an inner in them so you can get nice and comfy pockets. Um, not waterproof, but like a good kind of, you're not going to get soaked through them and they will dry out they easily dry throughout the day. Quickly. And same with the Mons Royal tops. They've got a sort of a wind guard as well and they could quick dry. So you don't, once you do get wet, you dry out pretty quick. Yeah, of course. I mean, footwear is a very personal preference choice. Um, like if I'm riding, I will wear my, like um, got a pair of Solomon um, hiking shoes that I wear, fully waterproof Gore-Tex. Um, really good for if you have to walk through some mud or anything, but equally so if I'm commuting or riding, say, on the cycleway next to the city. Um, something like that in winter is great because my feet stay dry. Get merino socks, um, icebreaker for the win. Yeah, cool. So we've got a couple of options here. Um, we've got 100% briskers, um, a really good kind of insulated glove, um, designed to keep your hands nice and warm. Um, we'll bring them up nice and close so you guys see. So a nice insulated outer layer there. Um, and they're really good. So that's what I'd recommend if you're going for warm. Waterproof, if it's really bucketing down, uh, these Gero pivots are really good. So full waterproof rating, um, they dry nice and quick, and they've also got touchscreen technology. So if you're, you're riding and you need to jump on your phone, I mean, hopefully you've got a waterproof phone, but um, that'll help. And also rated for about four degrees. Again, fortunate here in Auckland, we don't really get that. Um, but down the line, these will keep you guys nice and warm in winter. Definitely. Um, and a really, really good fitting glove. Yeah, well, so I mean, as Daniel kind of pointed out, getting like a backpack cover, something like that can be really good. Um, we sell a few, they're not just bike specific ones. Throughout our T7s, we have kind of multiple, um, multiple options. Reflective ones would be my recommendation as well. I've got a nice silver reflective one from Brave It. Also with waterproof bags, we also do waterproof panniers. So if you want to fit a rack to the back of your bike, then we can chuck panniers on that are also waterproof. And the other thing is little, little phone bags. So if you want to keep your phone nice and dry, this is the, um, the Locksack one. Um, a few other brands we sell, we have a Cedar Summit one as well. But these are really cool, it's a full waterproof kind of bag. You chuck your cell phone in, you can keep it in your pocket, keep it in your backpack if you need to pull it out, nice and dry. So indoor is really cool. Um, we're lucky nowadays with all the technology we have that you can get a full outdoor experience in the comfort of your living room. Um, first thing to kind of look at is bike trainers. There's a few different types. Um, main two being a smart trainer and a resistance trainer. Um, difference between them, smart trainer, hook it up to a Zwift or Sufferfest, anything like that. Um, you can see you can hook it up to a laptop, phone, tablet, anything like that, TV. Um, and the smart trainers are awesome because it reacts to what's showing on the screen. So if you're climbing up a big hill on your respective app, you're going to feel more resistance. It's going to get pretty tough. Resistance trainers, the old standard one, you've probably got one lying around your garage somewhere, um, works off, surprisingly, resistance. Um, you usually get a little lever that sits on your handlebars, almost like a shift lever, but it's a different resistance. Um, and they're always a little bit cheaper because they don't have that cool smart tech of being able to react to a real life ride, um, but they're still really good for being able to do kind of almost you know gym sessions on them. Um, anything like that. So that's kind of the main two differences. We've got the Wahoo Kicker Snap set up here. Um, a really good kind of mid-range option for a smart trainer. The other two things with kind of smart trainers is wheel on and wheel off. Um, wheel on, like the Kicker Snap here for an example, usually cheaper, a little bit quicker to put on, um, but you are going to wear through things like your tyre, your existing, you know, cassette, etc. like that. Uh, much quicker and every time you brake there's going to be a lot of speed going through that tyre and you're going to wear through them pretty quick. Yeah so it's personal preference, um, I would say direct drive. Um, it's almost the becoming the new standard um, in terms of trainers in that sense of you just snap on, you have a cassette on the trainer, so that's your training cassette, means you can go through that at your own pace, you go through you know, you still use your chain, your chain ring, all the rest of it. Um, but I would recommend kind of that direct drive for ease. You can have your, because you can have an old kind of, you know, not as good bike on your direct drive trainer and then keep your nice bike for going out on a real ride. Um, wheel on though, cheaper, bit quicker. You can put multiple bikes on a little bit easier because you use your own cassette and your own gears. So if you've got a nine speed road bike and then your partner's got an 11 speed road bike, for example, um, you can switch between them. Whereas a direct drive, you'd have to change the cassette, gets a bit more messy um, in those technicalities. So, personal choice. Uh, this is the Wahoo Climb. Um, really cool accessory to make that kind of indoor riding feel more outdoors. 
basically, if you watch, you can simulate going up and down a hill in, inside. Um, and it pairs up with your trainer and with Zwift. Um, so if you are doing a race, uh, racing through the Alps, you will get those up and down declines all through this. Um, Wahoo. And kind does, of, does that do it automatically through the program? Yeah, so once you set it up to link in with what this trainer reads, it uh, reads it all as one unit and you're good to go. Um, the kind of trifecta of Wahoo accessories, you get a headwind fan. Have a guess what that is? It gives you realistic wind in your house. So if you're going downhill super fast, you're going to get more wind. If you're going uphill, it's going to lessen a little bit. Wind conditions, etc. Um, so they're ones that make that indoor experience the most outdoor, but dry. Um, other ones are like a sweat net. Basically that sits from here to your seat post. Make sure you're covering all your frame, all your bits. You don't want your salty sweat dripping all over your bike. Pretty gross. Rust through your parts. Not a good thing. And it can actually destroy your bearings inside your headset. We've mm. been, we get a lot of people coming in with new headset bearings, needing new headset bearings because of the sweat. Um, it can also damage your rims. So it's good to take your bike off your trainer and give it a wash after a real heavy session. Um, and the other one is if you you don't have the kicker climb or anything like that and you've got your standard kind of front wheel on, uh, make sure you get a block for the front. Um, Tax, Wahoo, Elite all do different ones. Elite does a really cool smart steering one that links up with your Zwift or Suffest, anything like that. Um, directs you and make sure your bike's sitting level. Obviously on a trainer, you lift up the rear of your bike off the ground, your front's automatically facing down, you're in a more down position. Make sure you get a block. Some trainers come with them, some don't. Ask your local store, we can tell you which one's which. Uh, mountain, road, commuter, hybrid, they all basically work. Um, the main thing to check is what kind of hub you have um, and then what hubs are compatible with what trainer. Some trainers can only use like a standard quick release, some can do boost, if you know what that means. Um, there's a lot of different sizes, things, you get adapter kits. Come and see us, we can tell you which one's going to fit which. Um, lots of available info on the website as well for your online shoppers. Um, you can read about that, but rule of thumb, most bikes can fit on most trainers. Thanks guys. See you out there.